Hello, I'm Guy, and this is Guy Robot. Hello, this time I'm going to carry on with the configuration of my recent NAS build that I've made for 2017. If you haven't seen it already, you're going to want to check out part one of this series, which is the introduction to what this actual NAS build is. This video is pretty much just an extension of that world. It's to show you exactly how I configured my ESXi host and how I got all the different bits tweaked on it, so how I got the real tech network adapters working on it, packages for that installed, and how I go about configuring it. So if you've never installed ESXi before and got it configured, then this video will be useful to you. Give it some context, check out part one of the SAN video. Let's go. Okay, so now we're able to actually start configuring the ESX host, which is ultimately going to run this NAS and maybe a couple of other things. The install went pretty smoothly, as you saw on the video. However, since doing that, I decided to reinstall it, but to install it to an SSD rather than to a USB stick. The main reason for doing that is because this system hasn't got any internal USB ports. I didn't really just want a cable dangling inside with a memory stick or one on the back in case I try and tidy up the case further at a later date. So I thought start something to go on and I've used a pair of 80 gigabyte SSDs inside it, which we're going to configure further in just a minute. Now we're going to get started and configure this host. So we go to the web address, which is just HTTP kind of slash the IP address that you've set up on the host. And then we log it. So this is the web interface which is new for version 6 and above of ESXi. Previously there was a C-Sharp WinForms application. I'm not sure how much I like this so far. It seems to have all the same functionality, but there's still a part of me that is unhappy at web interfaces. I have also managed to crash this a couple of times during testing, so it's certainly not as stable as the old one, although that still wasn't fab. So the first thing we want to do is do the basic configuration on here. So if we go into the manage setting, then one of the first things I want to do is manage date and time to make sure that this is actually connected to the NTP for time synchronization. And the reason for doing that is that I want to connect this to my domain and actually Active Directory is quite a time sensitive protocol. So let's stick in the UK time servers. And we'll hit save there. We might as well enable the NTP service on the device as well and start that now for good measure then once we've done that the next thing i want to do before anything else is actually join this to the domain so we go over to security and users go to authentication and then here we can actually join a domain so all you have to do to join the sxi to the domain is just put in the name of your domain enter your domain admin account that's got it, or any account that's got pushed it join a machine to the domain and credentials and hit join domain you see that running down here, and very briefly, we should see you've successfully joined the domain. So then if we go into system and we go into advanced settings, the easiest way I find to do this to grant access to it is I actually have a active directory group where I've got any admin accounts that I want to be able to manage ESSX hosts. So if you enter advanced settings, just search for active, resist config, host agent, plugins, host services, ESX admin group, Double click that, or oh, sorry, click it, edit option, and then just put the name of your group that has administrator access. So in my case, I've called it gg-esxadmins, gg4 global group, hit save. Once that's done, I should now be able to log out on the root account. Now we should be able to just type in the login details of anybody that's in that gg-esxadmins account and log straight back in. There you are, magic. And now I'm logged in on my domain account rather than having to be logged in as root. So that's a good one as far as security and everything goes. The next thing I want to do, because I'm going to be using this as a NAS, and in particular I'm going to be using it as a NAS running free NAS, which uses ZFS for the file system, it's really important that I don't abstract away from the underlying hardware when it comes to storage. And in my case, I've got a dedicated HBA which is basically the SAS card that all my big drives are connected to. So rather than attaching the disks in VMware, creating a virtual disk and passing that through, or even just passing the hard disk through, I can do one better than that, and I can actually pass through the HBA itself. The whole PCI card can get sent through. So you can do this on any CPU that supports uh, a VTD 
on Intel. I think it's IOMMU on AMD. Basically, that rules you out Celerons and really low end ones, but pretty much all of the rest of the processors allow it. So you just go into Manage, go into Hardware, and PCI Devices, and this has to be enabled in your BIOS as well. So I've already enabled it in the BIOS on this one. So then I find the card I want to pass through, and any of the ones that are black rather than grey, I can pass through. So there's the ESART controller. At some point, I might want to pass that through, so I'll click it and I'll do toggle pass through. And then we select the LSI logic, which is my SAS one. We'll do toggle pass through on that. We're probably not going to need to pass through any of the USB 3, although if there was some point where I wanted to get USB 3 devices, that would definitely be the best way to do it. Network cards are going to stay this side. And then I think that's everything we want to have passed through for now. So now you'll see it says that restart is required. So at this point, we're just going to go back to the host. And then we've got the reboot option in here. And we're going to confirm that, yes, we do want to reboot this host. And just over two minutes later, and the host is back up so we can log back in again. Right, once we're back in here, there's a few more, somewhat more boring things we want to do, but we can just test that that hardware pass through has happened. If we go back on to manage PCI devices, you will now see that our SAS and eSATA controllers both have enabled next to them. Good stuff. The next thing we want to do is have a couple of services set up for us to access. So we want to turn on SSH, not generally production best concept of how to do it but in my home network here i'm more than happy to do so so we'll do start and stop with host and we'll do the same with the esxi shell as well and we will then start both of those and once we've done that we're going to also go into system go into auto star which allows virtual machines to come up when the system boots and we're going to turn that on so that it kicks off automatic boot so whenever a vm comes up it will start the machine back up and the default stop action is going to be to suspend it because we're running off SSD. So that's going to be quicker than rebooting something at a later date. Right. The next thing we want to do is actually set up our data stores. You'll notice there's actually one data store here. It's already created. So the idea for this build is that I'm going to have two separate boot drives in my virtual free NAS and they are going to be in a mirror and those two virtual boot drives needs to be on two different physical boot drives in the host so that at the end of the day I have a true redundant mirror available for me for the boot drive so that if either one of my actual genuine SSDs in this machine fails then I've still got my free NAS boot device. Now I am aware that if the one fails that I happen to have ESXi installed on I've lost ESXi but that's not a massive problem because I've got other installs of ESXi on USB sticks so I can if push comes to shove put one in really quickly boot it up and then just import the virtual machine from the remaining SSD as a data store so that's not a huge worry it's only going to affect me by you know 30 seconds of downtime and the reboot time while I find a memory stick. So we out the box have one SSD that's got ESXi on and the data store that's created. If we go into it, we can click data store browser and we can see that there's not a lot on that. So I'm going to go into here. I'm going to go actions. I'm going to go rename and I'm going to call this one internal SSD one as my first data store. Admittedly, not that much more of an exciting name, but when you've got network data stores, I find internal or network useful. And I like just knowing straight away if it's hard disk or SSD based ones. So the next thing I'm going to do is go on to storage and we want, you'll see we've only got the one data store at the moment for one drive. So if we have a look at devices, we have both SSDs here and it's not obviously clear because they're both Intel SSDs and the only difference is the serial number on them, which one's which. The easy thing to do is click on it and get some information about it. So that first one doesn't appear to have anything on there. So if we click new data store, Probably I should, what I should do is show you the other one as well. If we click on the second one, you'll see it already has a partition diagram. It's got all the stuff on there. It's got the data store. So it's this one that we want. And we click new data store. And we're going to call this one, unsurprisingly, internal SSD2. And other than that, we're going to go for a full disk. We're going to make it VF, VMFS6 because why not? That's all we're going to be accessing it from here. 
And other than that, we're going to go with all the defaults, wipe out everything that's already on the disk, but it was already a blank SSD, so that's good. And then we've got two different data stores. So if we go back into storage and data stores, we've now got two data stores. You'll see one of them has got bigger capacity than the other, and that's because the SSD one has got ESXi taken off a ton of space. If we go onto this one and go data store browser, bang, that one's also pretty empty. Now, because this is going to take a while, we might as well get it going off now. And what I'm going to do is actually upload the free lab NAS ISO. And you'll see that's now uploading from my other sand upstairs onto this one. Okay, and we've got the FreeNAS ISO there ready for later on when we actually want to set up a FreeNAS host. So the next thing is something that quite a lot of you guys are going to have if you've done what I've done and used a consumer motherboard here. If we go into networking, more network, look at physical NICs, you'll see, great, look, I've got four any 1000 drivers. Now, these are my Intel quad gigabit cards that I've got. Okay, it's not 10 gigabit, but they're still really nice cards and they are pretty expensive. They certainly were a couple of years ago, hundreds of pounds for a card. And odds are you've probably got a Realtek driver on one of your motherboards or all of your motherboards that you'd like to use in ESXi. Same here, this is a consumer board. Now I've got these four Intel ports and my actual end goal is to use these just for iSCSI traffic and to use the general network connection and non-iSCSI traffic over the Realtek card. Alas, there is no Realtek card because support was pulled by VMware in I think version 5.5 for the Realtek cards. Bit annoying, however, you can forcibly get the driver installed on the latest version. So that's what we're going to do now. The first thing we need to do is actually upload the driver to this machine. So if we go back to internal SSD2 data store and we go to upload, you'll see this file net55.vib, which is for our 8168, which is the real 8168 and the 8111. Now, I will post a link in the text or my blog post related to this with where to get this from, along with some step by step instructions for how to do this. That's all uploaded. So, the next thing we need to do is actually install that. So, you remember the last thing we did a minute ago was actually enable SSH, and we're going to use that now. So, if we open up SSH and we go to the VMware host, we can log in as our root account here. And then what we need to do, first of all, is tell it that we want to be able to install unofficial things. So ESX, CLI, software, acceptance, set level equals community supported. Host acceptance level change to community supported, always good to see. Then we need to actually install our bib. So this is a bit like Linux, even though it's not, or any other Unix system. So if we just have a look, first of all, if we go to cd slash vmfs for the VMware file system, you'll see there is a volumes one. If we go into volumes, you will notice there is my internal SSD one and two. So we'll go into SSD two, where we uploaded it to. If we have a look in there you will see we've got our net 55 file we uploaded. So now we just need to do ESX CLI software vib install dash v dot slash um, what is it called net 55. We could have done the full path rather than dot slash and gone into it, but that just gives you an idea of what it looks like. We'll whack enter now and wait for that to install. Not as quick as you feel it should be. And there we are. I realized I had actually forgotten you can't do dot slash doing this. As I said, this isn't actually Linux. It just tries to look like it. So you need the fully qualified path regardless. Uh, internal SSD2 slash that. There we are. So that's installed. But it says that the host needs to be rebooted. So we can now go back. We can close SSH. Go back to the host. And then we might as well do a reboot. And what we should get at this point is a real tech network card appearing let's give it a try and then we are back up so we log back into the host and i tell you what you have no idea how glad i am we're back up the thing that's really worth noticing with these real tech ones is that's not really supposed to work it's definitely not supported so i have had it before where on a system i have enabled the real tech network card and then 
all my other network cards have vanished. Just the real tech one has been there when I've come back. And if I've looked through all the modules, gone through all the logs, gone through absolutely everything else, the other cards were all loaded. Just they were never being assigned network names. And I couldn't figure it out for life for me. And I had to do a reinstall, and then it all started working again. Uh, I've heard other people whose cards work for two months and then have just suddenly stopped working without a full reboot of the system and have then worked forever. So, real tech cards, yes, you can get them working, but there may be an odd quirk or two in there. However, touch wood, I suspect. Oh, there we are. We've now got the R8168 for my R8 Treble 1 network card. Now, what I want to do is actually set that to be my management network. So, at the moment, we've got my management network for the default TCP IP stack. And what we need to do is move that on to the card we've just put in. So as you can see at the moment, it's on V switch one, which has got VM NIC one. So if we go into V switch one, we can change its uplink from VM NIC zero to VM NIC four. Hit save. If we start pinging it, it shouldn't be working. And I'm going to swap the cable. And with a great sigh of relief, we're back. So if we just refresh this to make sure we're connected properly, we can now see VMNIC4 has the management network on there, which is just what we wanted. And so at this point, what we actually need to do is now configure these NE1000 cards, my gigabit uh, PCI Intel cards, for iSCSI traffic, so I'm going to do probably not the as many ways I could do this. I think what I'm going to do is just create a virtual switch per card because I don't envisage plugging these into a system that supports link aggregation anytime soon. So I'm probably just going to have all four of them plugged in partially for backup purposes and maybe for round robin to help with it rather than aggregate it to be one four gig link. I might look into that in a future video. So for now, I'm just going to go into virtual switches. I'm going to create a new virtual switch called iSCSI1, iSCSI1 on VMNIC0. And then I'm going to do the same thing again three more times. Okay, and with that done, I'm going to go into port groups, and I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to create one port group for each of those switches and tie them directly on a one-to-one -one mapping. And what this will eventually give me is iSCSI one-to-four port groups, which can be directly assigned to virtual machines. And that will, in effect, assign the virtual machines network cards to marry one-to-one -one with the real network cards, which gives me the ability to semi-pass that through in a roundabout way underneath without actually having to pass the hardware through so I can also use it for other VMs if I want to, whereas pass-through is directly only to one machine. So at this point, everything should be set up on here. So the only thing we've got to do now is actually create our virtual machine. And that's it, ESXi is configured and we're good to get a virtual machine on there. In the next and final part of this series, I'm actually gonna set up that virtual machine and install FreeNAS and get that all configured. So don't forget to check out part three in this series. Hopefully you found this useful. If you did, please thumbs up it, leave a comment below and let me know you liked it. You can check me out on Facebook and Twitter at GuyRobotTV where I've normally got some bits and bobs for the upcoming videos that I'm working on and I'm happy to interact with you. And please don't forget to subscribe. Thanks.